And we're going to continue where we left off. Um, we were just starting to talk about genocide, uh, which is the last of our accusations against the Old Testament God. And uh, we had gotten, I think we had gotten as far as this, yeah. Uh, by the way, I, your test corrections I already did finish, but I'll, um, I'll pass those back later. So where we left off is we were talking about how the Canaanites were not just any group of people. They were a very nasty group of people. And uh, just kind of a, it's a quick review. I'm only putting down as a list the very tamest of what they did. Uh, <clears throat> you can kind of imagine the rest, but well, you probably don't want to spend much time doing that. But what's the main point? The, the point is that they, they had to be they had to be gotten rid of. Now, I'm not saying that's the justification of genocide, because what we're going to later see is that there was no genocide. There wasn't. But we'll talk about that later. However, to put it in context, we have to realize that these were people. Uh, this was a culture that had to be eliminated. Um, Ari, you can close that book. You can, clo you can close the book, please. The, the book, just close it. Oh, it's your notes. Excellent. In that case, keep it open. <laughs> All right, so they had to be eliminated. Now, it doesn't mean that every single individual had to be eliminated, but the culture um, as or the nation had to be. Now, here's the next thing to remember, and this is kind of this is going to kind of explain um, what I meant when I said that there was actually no genocide in the first place. And that is um, exaggeration was common in ancient war accounts. And I'm going to give you many examples of this to just keep driving the point home. So you see what I mean. And we're going to see that when the Bible talks about the complete elimination of so and so or such and such people, that they were simply using the historical techniques of the time, which were to exaggerate battle accounts. First example, Egyptian Tutmosis III boasted, the numerous army of Mitanni was overthrown within the hour, annihilated totally like those not existed. Now, this happened in 1500 BC. How do we know he was exaggerating? Because the Mitanni continued to exist. and There are abundant records of their existence many hundreds of years after this was written, which means annihilated totally was a total exaggeration. Now, you may ask, well, why did they do such things? Well, they did it for propaganda, for one thing. It made them look good to exaggerate. But also because they didn't have this historical or this exact idea of, of history as we do today. Exactness wasn't important to them. The Hittite Mursili II said that he made Mount Asharpaya in the mountains of Tarikarimu empty of humanity. Again, how do we know this was exaggeration? Because those people continued to exist. Now, it may, maybe it meant he wiped out a town or two, but certainly didn't get rid of the entire race. It was not a genocide. Just as the earlier case was not a genocide. Oh. The Egyptian Ramses II wrote that he slew the entire force of the Hittites and all the chiefs of all the countries. 1275 BC. But here's the funny thing. We know for a fact, and the Bible itself mentions it, that the Hittites continued to be uh, an enemy well after this time. Long after the promised land was settled. The Moabite King Misha bragged that the northern kingdom of Israel has utterly perished for always over a century before the Assyrian conquest. Now, again, utterly perished for always. Well, first of all, they didn't utterly perish. And second, it wasn't for always. Because, because those people continued to exist. If that were not true, there wouldn't even be a story of an Assyrian conquest. Hopefully you're getting the point, which I'm making abundantly clear. And if you walked in late, don't worry. Everything gets recorded. Fill in the holes later. The massacre of the Canaanites was incomplete. All right. So Yahweh wanted the obliteration of the religion. He wanted to get rid of the nation, the religion, the customs, the culture. He wanted to get rid of those. But that does not mean that Yahweh wanted the murder of everyone. And 
we know historically that the murder of everyone did not happen. The different Canaanite races continued to exist. Mr. Tran. How do we know that he commanded just the destruction of the religion, not just Well, no, that's the thing. He did command the destruction of every man, woman, and child. But what I'm saying is, first, that didn't actually happen, thanks to the exaggeration that we know from other war accounts of the time, right? And second, his intention was to get rid of the culture. So in other words, he commanded something that wasn't fully carried out, knowing that it wouldn't be fully carried out. How do we know that it wasn't fully carried out? I'm going to continue to explain that. But to answer your question in the short form, he did command that. Just like, by the way, he commanded the extermination of Isaac, which didn't happen. Joshua 13 and subsequent chapters indicate that much of the promised land remained unconquered. So we know for a fact that these annihilated peoples, so to speak, continued to exist. Even after, even after the command to uh, exterminate them had been issued. It simply wasn't possible to carry out the command fully. And to the extent that they did carry out the command, that little bit was exaggerated. So we've got both things to account for. A, the incomplete execution of command. B, the exagger exaggeration of said incomplete execution. <clears throat> now, here's some proof that these people still existed, even after the so-called genocide. In the book of Joshua, you hear God's command, for if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you and intermarry with them, so that you associate with them and they with you, know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you. So let's put this in context. This is said after the so-called extermination orders have been given, which means they weren't carried out. Now they were partially carried out, as I'm about to explain, they weren't fully carried out. If they had been, then Yahweh's command here would make absolutely no sense. In Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 6, we hear of doom for the pagans, but survival for some. I'm going to read that. And then we'll fit it into the discussion. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But this is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, hew down their sacred poles, and burn their idols with fire. Notice that he is talking explicitly here about the destruction of their religion and about their idols. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Now, <clears throat> clearly, altars were smashed, right? But if he can even talk about not intermarrying with these people, it means that they continued to exist in some way. They were not completely massacred. And this is because dispossession is not the same as annihilation. Now, in the exaggeration comment of the day, and I've given you many examples of that, right? In non-Christian and non-Jewish historical sources. Dispossession would be considered the same as annihilation. They even bragged about dispossession as annihilation. But that's an exaggeration. Dispossession, destroy their religion, their culture, take away their land, whatever. But it does not mean kill them all. It's a very important thing to clarify. Most Canaanite cities like Jericho, I, and Hazor were military forts. Civilians generally lived in rural areas. Okay, so we have basically our third way of approaching the genocide problem. The first way is greatly exaggerated. 
The second way is it was incompletely executed because a lot of the people survived. And the third way is perhaps the most important of all, is that the towns that were asked to be destroyed were forts. And so where were most of the men, women, and children? They had evacuated. That's the way ancient warfare worked, people. If there is a besieging army, get the families out. So these were military targets. It's not like going to, you know, I don't know, bomb some little town in Kansas. No. It's bombing the Navy base, right? To, to kind of give you an analogy. That's what these were. These were military targets. And Yahweh did not command them to destroy civilian towns or farms. Any civilians living in the city would likely have evacuated by the time the Israelites arrived to lay siege. And in fact, they would, have, they would have gotten out of there many, <clears throat> many weeks right. ahead of time. Because in ancient times, sieges always started with the, uh, the enemy army surrounding the town. The ban or harem applied to men, women, children, and livestock, but this doesn't mean that women and children were necessarily present. Okay, go to go to Hazor and kill every man, woman, and child. Okay, Yahweh, we will. And they get to Hazor, and there are no men, women, and children. Does that mean they disobeyed Yahweh? Well, heck no. You guys get what I'm saying? The command was issues. That doesn't mean it was carried out. In fact, it's extremely likely that it was not carried out. How do we know this? Because we know how ancient warfare worked. All right, I'm going to finish off with, um, and we're actually finishing the topic, which is good. Uh, we'll start the new topic, which is about the Bible and science and how they work. We'll start that after the break. But I do want to show you this video, which is pretty good. And I left the link in case, in case you ever want to see it on your own. Let me just copy it. Some of what he says is what I already said, but there are a couple new points that are worth, worth looking at. And if you're watching the recording, you may not see the video, but you can use that link that I just copied and paste it in your own browser. Can you turn off the lights, please? Both lights. Hypothetical question. If you had to choose between the God of the Old And let me just switch the sound. Testament and the God of the New Testament. Which one would you choose? If your answer is anything other than they're the same God, it's a false question. You might have some heretical tendencies we need to deal with. While popular conceptions of the Bible would lead us to believe that the God of the Old Testament is one of anger and revenge, and the God of the New Testament is one of love and forgiveness, when we actually read the Bible, the story looks quite different. This is Catholicism in focus. <laughs> Can the people in back here all right? When we look to the most exciting passages of the Old Testament, the ones that are most often depicted in popular media, it's easy to see how God is often portrayed in a negative light. He wipes out the entire earth with a flood, confuses people with speech so they won't be able to communicate, and destroys two major cities with everyone still in them. And that's just in the first book of the Bible. Throughout its pages, it's not uncommon to see God depicted as a warrior, filled with anger and exacting revenge on his enemies. Because these are fairly powerful images that don't always fit with the expectations of God, it's hard not to define the Old Testament God as angry and simply ignore him when we get to the kinder Jesus. Which is a shame, because there is so much more at work here. For every moment of anger we see from God in the Old Testament, there are dozens of instances of love, mercy, patience, and most of all, fidelity. Take, for example, the story of the Kingdom of Israel. On the surface, all we see is that God got angry with the people, and so willed that they be destroyed by a foreign nation, scattering them around the world. 
not a great snapshot of God. But look at the story in full, starting all the way back in Exodus. Enslaved by the Egyptians and forced to worship Pharaoh, God hears the cry of the Israelites and sets them free. Leading them to the desert, he provides all of their needs, giving them food, protection, land, and even making a covenant of love with them. As long as they keep the law he sets before them, worshiping him exclusively and acting with justice, he will keep them as his treasured possession. And what do they do? No more than a few chapters later, they make a golden calf to worship, breaking their end of the deal. <sighs> but does he forget the covenant and have them all killed, as was the terms of the agreement? No. They continue to live, and he continues to be their God. What's more, their children are still allowed to enter the promised land, even though the people had broken the covenant. And so goes the story for a thousand years. Israel disobeys God, God gets angry, but ultimately forgives them. Time and time again, they make false idols, worship other gods, oppress the poor, steal from the widow, and completely disregard God's justice. They live with evil in their hearts, and God continues to forgive them. He sends prophets to warn them and miracles to win them back. Throughout the prophetic writings, God speaks as a husband who has been cheated on, hurt, and disgusted, and wanting to win Israel back. For a thousand years, he was loving, merciful, patient, and absolutely faithful to a covenant that the people didn't deserve. Until enough was enough, and he allowed them to be destroyed. They received the punishment they had deserved for a millennium. Angry God, right? Except his anger lasts for but a moment. Within two generations, he offers the people forgiveness, restores their nation, and tries again. He shows love, mercy, patience, and faithfulness once more, only to have Israel disobey him again. When we look at the instances of God's anger within the larger story of salvation history, what we are left with is not a God that is angry by nature, but a God who is actually remarkably well-tempered and is far more merciful than we would ever be. So, sure, the God of the Old Testament wasn't as bad as we think, but how can he meet the love of Jesus, right? Clearly, there is still a big difference between how Jesus treats his people and how the Old Testament God does. While the conception that many people have of Jesus is of a free-loving hippie that preached a message of peace and forgiveness, never doing anything unkind to anyone, the Gospels tell a different story. Once again, when we look to the most exciting passages of the New Testament, those that are most often depicted in popular media, it's easy to see how Jesus is often portrayed in such a positive light. But dig a little below the surface, and you will see a God that might even be more harsh than that of the Old Testament. Take, for instance, his preaching. While most of us will think immediately of his words of forgiveness and love, the majority of what he says is actually quite extreme and forceful. He comes to cast the mighty from their thrones and lift up the lowly. By his own admission, he did not come to bring peace of the sword, creating divisions within religion and among families. Jesus demands faith and has absolutely no patience for his adversaries, rather than giving them time or overlooking their faults, like is often seen in the case of the Old Testament. He calls them hypocrites and publicly shames them. What's worse is when we compare the consequences for turning away from God between the Testaments. In the Old Testament, the worst that God does is inflict pain on the body, or in extreme cases, cause physical death. But compare that to Jesus' words to the Pharisees, how he plans on judging the nations in Matthew 25, or what will come at the end of times in the book of Revelation. Not only do people risk their mortal lives, Jesus threatens them with the damnation of their souls. I'm not sure about you, but that sounds a lot worse. And yet entirely consistent with what we see in the Old Testament from God. While the specific words and stories might be different, the overall revelation of God's nature is the exact same. God loves freely and widely, demands fidelity, and rejects those who are arrogant enough to think that they don't need God. Although seemingly different on the surface, there is only one God. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And this presents an interesting predicament for us, doesn't it? For if there is but one God, that means that the God of humility and peace we see in the New Testament is the same one that wages wars on his enemies in the Old Testament. But it also presents us with a rather wonderful opportunity. The opportunity to have our false conceptions of God challenged and recalibrated. It's an opportunity to see that the law of God in the Old Testament actually demands love of one's enemy. That many of the miracles of Jesus were first enacted a thousand years before his earthly birth. And that even in his anger, the God of old was the source of love and fidelity for the world. This sounds strange to us, or we can't seem to reconcile the two testaments with one another. Maybe it's time we took a closer look at what we actually know about each, and find that there's still more to learn about God than we could ever know.
turn the lights back on. Please. So what I like best about that one is um, he, he makes clear this kind of uh, this idea that isn't isn't commonly heard that, you know, it's kind of a cliche. Oh, yeah, the nice Jesus. But but he makes a really good point. You know, there are times when Jesus isn't that nice because being nice is not the same as being a good Christian. You guys ever think about that? Um, we live in a world where being nice is considered the greatest value. Um, oh, uh, you disagree with a transgender person. Well, you better not talk about it because you want to be nice and you want to accept everybody. Someone's teaching critical race theory. Well, let's be nice. We need to make room for that in our curriculum. Jesus wouldn't have said that. Jesus was not nice sometimes. Let's just clarify that. Sometimes Jesus was not nice. Why? Because he loved. He wasn't nice to the Pharisees because he wanted to wake them up. You guys get it? There are times when God is not nice because God loves. And there are times when we aren't supposed to be nice because that's not the loving thing to do. I'll give an example, right? <clears throat> Maybe this has happened to you guys before. But, I don't know, a conversation comes up and... And someone says something like, oh, yeah, you know, personally, I'm against abortion, but I really don't think it should be legislated or that or that, you know, um, we should take away from a woman's right to choose. Well, the nice thing to do is, oh, uh -huh, yeah, and maybe change the subject, whatever. The nice thing to do is don't disagree. The not nice thing to do is to disagree because you love. Do you guys understand the difference? It's a really important thing for us to understand. The world is not going to like you. When you go to college, maybe you're a college freshman, not, might not be the case if you're at like um, Steubenville or TAC or some of the really solid Catholic schools. But if you are a freshman at a college that isn't explicitly Catholic and you want to be faithful to your beliefs, there are going to be people who <laughs> don't like you. So get used to the idea now. Jesus said, I have come not for peace, but for division. Does that mean Jesus likes us to fight? Well, heck no. Jesus wants us to. He wants us to get along. But what he's telling us is that there are times when getting along has to be sacrificed for the greater good of the truth. Does that make sense, Jose? And it's not a pleasant message. Um, Jesus had people during his lifetime that absolutely hated him, which is why they found a way to kill him. Why did they hate him? Because sometimes he wasn't nice. But why wasn't he nice, Mr. Feynman? Because he cared about people. It's kind of a hard gospel message that I think gets overlooked a lot. It's why I like about, um, you know, what Father Casey says here. Um, is to kind of put it in perspective and realize, realize that Old Testament God, New Testament God um, is, is a God who loves. But love sometimes means doing things that are not pleasant or saying things that are not pleasant. Um, how many of you have ever gotten into it about abortion with someone who disagrees with you? Yeah, so you know what that's like. You know what that's like. Um, and maybe you lost a friend, maybe you didn't, but um, it's a very divisive issue along with critical race theory and gender ideology and many other things that we have right now. Okay, folks, well, um, we are done with that topic. I'm going to give you a quick preview on the next topic. So in the next topic, we're going to be talking about um, the Bible and science. In other words, um, we've already talked about the historicity of the Gospels, credibility of the Bible, but now we're going to talk about how we can reconcile science in our, our modern day understanding of science with things that the Bible says. So that'll be a very interesting topic as well. I'm going to end it there.